Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with a lecture on erythrocytes for anatomy and physiology too. Erythrocytes, as you know, are commonly referred to as red blood cells due to their appearance. They appear red. This color is due to the presence of iron on the hemoglobin molecule that, are, that uh, is packed in a red blood cell cytoplasm. And as you're already aware as well, erythrocytes are only one of the formed elements in whole blood. They make up about 45% of total blood volume, and we call that the hematocrit. In each microliter of blood, which is smaller than a drop from an eyedropper, there are four to six million erythrocytes, tons of erythrocytes. The hematocrit in females is a bit lower than in males. Notice in the table that the value for women is 42% and the value for men is 47%. This difference is primarily due to three factors. Women tend to lose clotted red blood cells during menstruation. so. Um, they might not lo lose a lot of plasma, but they, they lose the red blood cells. And women tend to have a higher percentage of body fat, which at first doesn't mean very much, but it is correlated to lower red blood cell numbers, perhaps due to more yellow bone marrow instead of ro red bone marrow, but I don't really know if that's true. But the biggest factor, probably the biggest factor, is that males continuously produce androgen hormones, like testosterone, and this stimulates red blood cell production. So more red blood cells are produced in males. Now let's look at the unique structure of red blood cells. These cells are biconcave, kind of depressed in the middle on both sides, and are very small, only four, sorry, seven to five, 7.5 micrometers in diameter. That's 65 times smaller than one grain of salt, really small. And the picture on the bottom is a pencil point, um, and it shows you all the different, all the red blood cells that fit on the tip of that pencil. They don't have any organelles, no mitochondria, no nucleus, no ribosomes. They can only make ATP through anaerobic means. That means glycolysis as well as aerobic fermentation. And um, they did have a nucleus when they first formed before they became mature and ribosomes. And during that immature stage, they were able to make proteins. And hemoglobin is the protein that they made the most of. And so the cytoplasm is just packed with hemoglobin. And of course, this hemoglobin aids in one of the functions of erythrocytes. There's two main functions that we'll talk about here. One is gas transport, and the second is acid-base balance. You're already aware of the fact that erythrocytes are involved in gas transport, but we haven't yet talked about the hemoglobin aspect. The hemoglobin is in the cytoplasm of red blood cells, and each hemoglobin molecule can bind four oxygens. There's four different irons in well, one in each heme group. So there's four heme groups. The heme groups contain iron and the oxygen can bind there. The carbon dioxide that hemoglobin can transport um, doesn't bind to a heme group. Instead, it binds to the polypeptide. And we'll look at that in more detail on the next slide. Another function of erythrocytes is acid-base balance. 
This is due to an enzyme located in red blood cell cytoplasm <clears throat> called carbonic anhydrase. This is how the enzyme functions to help with acid-base balance, right? So it's got this um, enzyme which makes carbonic acid. Notice in the diagram that carbon dioxide diffuses from body tissues into the plasma. And some of that carbon dioxide gets into red blood cells, and it's just kind of shown here. Inside the red blood cell, carbon dioxide combines with water in the cytoplasm and with the aid of carbonic anhydrase, forms an acid called carbonic acid, or H2CO3. Since this is an acid, a hydrogen ion can be released, dissociate, and move to the plasma. And so if you have more hydrogen ions in the plasma, the pH will drop. So this is the function of erythrocytes in acid-base balance, the formation of an acid. The blood can also help um, with buffering acid, and that's a more complicated topic that we'll discuss later in the course. So let's look at hemoglobin in a little bit more detail. So about 33% of the red blood cell cytoplasm is due to hemoglobin. So there's lots of hemoglobin in these cells. And each hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains. Two of them are called alpha chains and two are called beta chains. There are also four heme groups, kind of shown with red here. Um, and that is the site where iron and oxygen attaches. Carbon dioxide would bind instead to the polypeptide region. Okay, now we're going to look at the life cycle of erythrocytes. Um, how long do they live? Where are they born? All that. Um, and when we do that, we're going to look at the life cycle of all formed elements and compare the difference. So erythrocytes live for 120 days, about four months. Leukocytes, it depends on which type you're talking about. Some live very short lives, just one to five days. That, that would include neutrophils. And we haven't done leukocytes yet, but neutrophils are the most common leukocyte. But others live for years, and the, this would include the lymphocytes. These are the cells that give you long-term protection against infection. And then if you look at platelets, they live for five to 10 days. So as you can imagine, we're continuously producing blood cells of all types, really. So now we're gonna look at um, blood formation the term for blood formation is hematopoiesis. Some people use hematopoiesis to just refer to cell production, not blood production. But if you think about it, we also need to produce plasma when we make blood. Okay, so let's look at the process of blood formation. It occurs in the bone marrow where hematopoietic stem cells are located. And every day you're producing 100 billion new cells. And there are different terms and processes for the different types of cells that are formed. Um, erythropoiesis for red blood cells, leukopoiesis for white blood cells, and thrombopoiesis for platelets. But of course, you know, it's not just the cells that we have to form, it's also plasma. Plasma has to be replaced. If it's lost or if it's the water um, 
evaporates into the environment. I mean, we always need to replace our plasma. And we do this by ingesting water, which is absorbed from the intestine. Remember, plasma is 90% water. And then plasma proteins are mainly produced by the liver, you know, like albumin and all the clotting factors, and then transported to blood vessels. Now, if we just look at the part of hematopoiesis that involves um, cell production, and we look at that in more detail, we see that this um, study of hematopoiesis or cell formation was the first field to identify what we commonly call stem cells now. Now, stem cells, it's like an everyday word, but back when they discovered how blood cells were formed, they didn't necessarily know about stem cells and stem cell therapy and things. These hematopoietic blood stem cells are present in the bone marrow and they're very naive. They have not yet differentiated or developed into any specific type of blood. These cells can divide and then one of them will become a mature specific blood cell and the other will remain a stem cell. That enables the body to keep a population of stem cells in the bone marrow. Now, depending on what the body needs, this developing blood cell may go towards one of two lineages, the myeloid lineage or the lymphoid lineage. We'll stick with myeloid, okay, for now. So notice as a cell continues to develop along this line, it enters various stages and it could eventually become a red blood cell, maybe a platelet, or maybe even one of three leukocyte types called granulocytes. But if the cell differentiates and develops towards the lymphoid lineage, now we'll look at that, the cell's destined to become either a lymphocyte or a natural killer cell. Now you don't have to memorize this graph. Um, it's not that important that you know each the names of each of these stages. I'll show you what you do have to know on the next slide. But um, I think it's just interesting to note that one lineage produces a variety of different cell types. It's kind of unique how that works. So erythropoiesis takes about 15 days and it involves stem cells proliferating through mitosis and then differentiating into mature cells. It's initiated by a hormone called erythropoietin that's produced in the kidney. So after erythropoietin travels to the bone marrow and erythropoiesis occurs, the mature red blood cells enter the bloodstream and they live for 120 days carrying oxygen and carbon dioxide and then eventually they break down and that's called hemolysis. But we need to talk a little bit more about the stages of erythropoiesis um, before we talk about hemolysis or breakdown. So the hematopoietic stem cell that we talked about earlier is shown here on the left and no, it's in the bone marrow. And notice that it has a nucleus, okay? It does eventually change a bit in shape and become this thing called a proerythroblast, but I don't care that you know that term at all. So these are the cells that can divide by mitosis. And those are the cells that respond to the hormone erythropoietin, both of these two. So they contain a nucleus and there's ribosomes, although you can't see them in the picture. Eventually, the cell changes shape again and becomes what we call an erythroblast. So it's a little bit more mature. 
During this erythroblast stage, the cell is busy making hemoglobin, which fills the cytoplasm. In the next stage, the cell is called a reticulocyte, and that's when it ejects its uh, organelles and the nucleus. So here you can see fragmentation of the nucleus and organelles, and those will be ejected from the cell. Finally, the erythrocyte is now mature. And this is the stage that we would prefer it to leave the bone marrow and enter the bloodstream. Sorry, just, okay, it stopped going, like magnifying and decreasing again. So as I was saying, the erythrocyte is the preferred stage to enter the blood. But in actuality, some reticulocytes also enter the blood. So on a blood smear, you might see 1% to 2% of the cells as reticulocytes. But they should be about the same size as a mature erythrocyte. And we'll look at those in the lab. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about how erythropoiesis is regulated. We know what triggers it, and it's low, it's you know the hormone erythropoietin. But what causes erythropoietin production, right? Well, it's low oxygen in the blood, also called hypoxemia. So if you have low blood or low oxygen in the blood, that's sensed by certain liver and kidney cells. The kidney then makes erythropoietin. The liver can make a little bit too. And erythropoietin travels in the blood to the bone marrow, which stimulates stem cells to divide and mature. Then you get an increased number of red blood cells that travel in the blood to the lung and more oxygen can be absorbed. And so this is an example of negative feedback, if you think about it, because now you have higher, you started off with low oxygen in the blood, and now you have higher oxygen in the blood, and that will stop erythropoietin secretion. Now also to make healthy red blood cells, we need to make sure that hemoglobin, hemoglobin production is adequate. And for that, we need iron. So the iron comes from our diet, what we ingest, so uh, enters the stomach, and the iron is separated from whatever we've eaten, and it leaves the small intestine to enter the bloodstream. So the iron is taken up into the bloodstream. Now that's where the red blood cells are. And the red blood cells can then take up the iron and put it in the hemoglobin. If there's any excess iron in the blood, the liver will store it and then release it when needed. So that's the end of formation of red blood cells. Now what happens after the 120 days? Well, um, it becomes less flexible and more rigid with time as the cell membrane um, incurs damage traveling through small vessels. They, it become, they become more fragile and um, they become rigid, as I mentioned, and so they become trapped in really small vessels. That happens in the spleen in particular because the spleen has a lot of small capillaries. And so you'll see that broken red blood cells will kind of aggregate in certain portions of the bloodstream in the spleen. So the rigid cells become trapped in small circulatory vessels, um, vesicles. And Sometimes we refer to the spleen as the red blood cell graveyard. But hemoglobin is released from these fragmented red blood cells.
and we need to do something with the fragmented cells and we need to do something with that hemoglobin that has been released into the blood. We need to do cleanup essentially. So this is what happens to the products of hemolysis. There are cells called macrophages in the blood and stored in spleen tissue that can be imported into the blood. They perform phagocytosis. So they will take up all these red blood cell fragments. They also break down the hemoglobin into its different parts, into globe globin chain, sorry, globin chains and heme groups. The heme gets turned into bilirubin and the iron is separated out. The globin chains get broken down into different smaller chains of just amino acids. All of these breakdown products stay in the bloodstream. Amino acids can then be reused for protein synthesis, taken up by cells and used to make proteins. The bilirubin that has been formed from the heme is taken up by liver cells and put into the bile. We eventually then excrete that bile with our feces. And the iron, of course, is taken up by the liver to be reused as well. So this is just a picture that shows the same thing. Erythrocytes circulate for 120 days. Often it's the spleen where red blood cell fragmentation occurs. And um, macrophages will phagocytize the cell membrane fragments and degrade the hemoglobin. The heme group gets turned into bilirubin and the glob globins get broken down into free amino acids. The bilirubin is what we focus on. It actually um, is taken up from the bloodstream into the liver and the liver puts it into bile which goes into our feces. And the iron is also taken up by the liver and stored. Okay, our last topic for erythrocytes has to do with disorders. And we're gonna look at just two disorders related to erythros, uh, erythrocytes. One is polycythemia, which is defined as an increased red blood cell count. And the other is anemia, which is a decreased ability of the blood to carry oxygen. First, the details of polycythemia. So someone has an increased red blood cell count. Why is that a problem? So what? Well, then you have an increased blood volume due to cells, increased blood viscosity, and that will increase your blood pressure. Chronic polycythemia, like a really high red blood cell count for long periods of time, can lead to vessel obstruction and damage. You can also get um, kind of um, aggregates of red blood cells called uh, thrombi or emboli, an embolism is a traveling blood clot that causes obstruction. A thrombus is a stationary blood clot. It could break free and travel around. But then you could have a problem in the brain due to the presence of this clot, sort of a clot, um, like a stroke in the brain, or it could lead to heart failure. Now, primary polycythemia is due to too much erythropoiesis, and that is usually a cancer. The term for that cause of polycythemia is polycythemia vera. So there's a cancer in the bone marrow. But a secondary polycythemia which is probably more common, 
is due to chronic low oxygen in the blood. And that's usually due to lung disease. It could also temporarily be due to being at a high altitude where the oxygen levels in the atmosphere are lower. But chronic low O2 can actually produce polycythemia as well. So that's one disorder. The other disorder we're going to look at is anemia. So anemia was defined as the inability of blood to carry oxygen adequately. This could be due to either low red blood cell count or maybe there's something wrong with the hemoglobin or there isn't enough hemoglobin. Now, of course, the complications um, from anemia are pretty obvious. You're going to have tissue hypoxia. That will probably cause an increased heart rate. And so you'll see tachycardia. That's an increased heart rate. You'll have a low blood volume and low blood pressure, but that'll be compensated for with tachycardia. And you'll have low blood osmolarity as well. So you'll tend to lose plasma from the blood and develop edema. Now there's various causes of anemia um, and we can categorize them by type. One type would be hemorrhagic anemia. That just means anemia caused by excessive bleeding, right? So that can usually be repaired. It's usually been um, a trauma damage. Well, it depends. In childbirth, I suppose that's sometimes trickier, but you can usually repair an injury and then supplement by transfusing blood. So that's one. Another cause of anemia would just be inadequate erythropoiesis. Now you might be making red blood cells just fine, but if your diet is deficient in iron, your hemoglobin will not adequately carry oxygen, and so you'll be anemic. And the um, treatment for that's pretty obvious. You just take in more iron in your diet. The last cause is hemolytic uh, anemia, and that means that there's an increased hemolysis for some reason. And we're going to look at one example of that uh, sickle cell disease, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder in which red, red blood cells are broken down. Hemolysis occurs at a greater rate than it should. It's due to um, an abnormal gene called the sickle cell gene. And we denote the gene with HBS. This type of hemoglobin doesn't bind oxygen well. In addition, it's shaped funny, the hemoglobin is. So the cells become kind of stiff and sickle-shaped. That's how it gets its name. So that's a sickle-shaped cell right there. These cells don't go through blood vessels very well and they rupture. And so you have hemolysis. Now, with treatment, somebody who has two copies of the sickle cell hemoglobin gene have a low life expectancy, less than 50 years. And that's with treatment. And I don't exactly know. It's probably transfusions. But let's consider a different case. Let's consider someone who has what we call the sickle cell trait. These individuals have one abnormal copy and one normal copy of the hemoglobin gene. So that means they've got some hemoglobin that functions pretty well and they can carry oxygen. These individuals are usually symptom free. Some cells do become sickle shaped, that's true and you'll lose those cells, but you'll have enough normal cells and enough oxygen that should be symptom free. But if you exercise with at least sustained exercise, 
you'll get fatigued quite easily. If you go up in the mountains, high atmospheric pressure where there's low oxygen, you'll feel faint and fatigue. And occasionally they'll have chest pain. But those symptoms can usually be allevi alleviated um, with supplemental oxygen or just, you know, staying at sea level would be nice. Um, <clears throat> but I want to talk about the sickle-shaped cells for a second. These sickle-shaped cells with a lot of sickle-shaped, I'll call it hemoglobin, they can become infected with malaria. Any red blood cell can be infected with malaria. Red blood cells that are normal and infected with malaria will die. This cell will die. This normal red blood cell will die. But the sickle cell will live. So even if it's carrying less oxygen, it survives. So for this reason, individuals that are heterozygous, we say, and have one sickle-shaped gene, or one sickle cell hemoglobin gene, and one normal hemoglobin gene, they're usually um, immune to malaria, or resistant would probably be a better word, resistant to malaria because not all of their red blood cells will rupture. This uh, prevalence of heterozygous individuals is predominant in certain regions of Africa where we see that 45% of the population are what we call sickle cell carriers. They're heterozygous for that gene. That's because this is where, um, in central regions of Africa, this is where malaria is prevalent. And um, when the malaria infects the sickle cells, the sickle cells don't die right away, but eventually the macrophages will destroy the parasites inside the erythrocytes. So it's an advantage in a small way to having a sickle cell allele. Thank you very much for listening. That's all for this lecture.